All right. Hey, everybody. We're live, and we are ready to roll here. Welcome to Phys Ed Summit 4.0. Uh, my name is Colin Brooks, and I'm a member of the Phys Ed Summit team. Really glad that you could uh, be here with us today and join us for this conversation that we're going to have about large class hacks. So, um, we are again using Tozzl to bring you to the Phys Ed Summit. So, make sure that you're on the Tozzl, giving it a look right now. Not only can you view the presentation from the Tozzl, but you can also find uh, any presenter resources and participate in the real-time conversation using the Tozzle as the back channel. Uh, this will also be the place that um, the presenters throughout the day and within this conversation will be dropping their files or sharing their resources with. Um, if there's any difficulties with the video feed, uh, you can we'll post a new link in the Tozzle, so just hang tight there. We'll replace the YouTube video. So with that, uh, I'm going to, so I've got uh, another member of the Phys Ed Summit team here, um, and I'll let him introduce himself, and then uh, we'll pass it over to our panel and just start this good conversation we're having right now. Hey, everybody. Uh, Matt Pomeroy here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Phys Ed underscore Pomeroy. I'm coming live from uh, just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm a 7th and 8th grade a health and physical educator and uh, dealt with some large class sizes myself. and, and Always kind of an ever-changing atmosphere. You never know what you're going to get uh, every year that you teach. But uh, I'm excited to uh, maybe help some teachers overcome some obstacles and um, kind of tackle this this issue that that sometimes you know we <coughs> feel. So I'm glad to be here, and uh, we've got some experts. So I'm going to send it your way and uh, introduce yourself and let them know a little bit about you. All right, I can jump in here. I'm Adam Metcalf, and I teach just outside of Chicago. Um, I teach at a, a K through eight school for academically gifted students, and um, yeah, I'm here to just to share a few ideas, a few uh, routines and transitions, uh, things that I use that could be helpful for other teachers out there, hopefully, that are uh, needing a few ideas about dealing with uh, large class sizes in PE. All right, I'll go. Right, as we've not got, we've got technical difficulties, here's my text overlay, Mr. Adam P.E. I'm coming at you all the way from Saudi Arabia today. Um, I'm the AD, head of department at a K-12 through school, and my class sizes range from 15, that's the small class size, all the way through to 55. So hopefully with the bigger classes, with my elementary kids, i share a few ideas with you today. Cool. Uh, my name is Ben Landers, and I am coming to you from Columbia, South Carolina, United States. And uh, I teach elementary school K through fifth. Been teaching for nine years. Um, you can catch me at pespecialist.com. And my classes range kind of similar to Adam. I have some with 18, and then some go all the way up to 50. So. All right, so with that, everybody, thanks for introducing yourselves. And yeah, I, just a little bit more. I've, I've definitely had my fair share of large class sizes. Um, so this will definitely be a good conversation to have and just working on keeping things, you know, really positive, in, in, you know, in our conversation about just how to problem solve and help, help us to be better physical educators in our specific environments. So I just want to open up this question to our panel here and ask you what is... When you have a large classroom, how is it that you begin this large class? You know, what kind of introductory activities are you doing with students to get them ready for their day? Okay, I'll jump in. Um, last year, this was like the first time I taught such a big class, and I was teaching 55 kids by myself. And I used to get all the kids in, and I used to get them sat down. We'd go through the learning objectives, etc. And then I was on some professional learning over the summer and the tutor was talking to me she said as soon as you get the kids in get them moving so I tried it this year and it's definitely helped me massively so as soon as I get the kids in I get them moving I get them skipping I get them marching I get them jogging sidestepping crab walk anything I can think of I get them moving and then when I get them free frozen I get we have um, home spots so we have very small bits of tape 
um, you know, the duct tape. We, I call it duct tape. Do you guys call it duct tape, the strong stuff? Yeah. Um, so I get little squares all the way down my gym. Tell them to freeze. Okay, go to your home spot. And that home spot is where they go every session. So for me, that's a great way of just getting them in, burn off that little quick bit of energy, and then they're ready to listen once they come in for that home spot. So that's how I start my lesson. Yeah, I'm going to jump in because mine is very similar to uh, what Adam Levo said. Um, let me show you a couple things. I, if you can see this here. Um, I've made a whole bunch of these posters, um, and I, I'll share these in the... Um, in the tassel there, a link to these. But I get them printed off of a website called shortrunposters.com. And these are, they got math problems on them. So, I mean, we, I have probably 20 of these things uh, that I rotate through. And just like Adam was saying, uh, when I have one large class coming in, I usually have one large class leaving. And my classes are about 34 students, but I've had classes ranging up to like 64 as well. So um, when my kids come in, they start with just walking laps. And then once the other group is pretty much out the door, then we start you know, jogging, skipping, all those types of dynamic uh, warm-ups. Uh, we might play a game, like an instant activity game, or do a quick dance that we all know. Uh, and then I'll send them to, to do one of these warm-up posters. Um, Sometimes there's just one. Sometimes I'll put three of them up, uh, maybe two in the back, one up front, and I'll say, you know, choose your warm-up poster and then complete that. Uh, it has some math problems on it, so sometimes the little ones need help solving those math problems, which um, they can use their classmates to do so, or if, if it's really tough, um, they can come see me and I can show them how to, how to do it. But uh, for the most part, the warm-up, the start of class runs itself, uh, and I think it's so important to have routines. Um, so once, and that whole warm-up process takes anywhere from three to five minutes, uh, and then, yes, they're ready to listen for the, the objectives of, of, you know, today's lesson. Um, so I think it's, it's nice to have a consistent warm-up process and then have a spot for them to go. Um, duct tape, uh, you know, it works for, for Adam. For me, I have kind of a, you know, an area where they can go and, and have a seat. Some of my classes have a choice of where they can go, either sit, squat, kneel, or if they want to stand, they can stand in the back. Um, other classes who have a little bit more difficulty listening and following directions, I have assigned spots for them to go to so that they can, you know, tune in and stay tuned in to what we're uh, discussing for that part of the class. Um, so that's how I begin my class. Um, and it's wor it works really well from kindergarten all the way up to the, the older kids, all the way up to my eighth graders. So um, they're used to it because they've, they've had it for years, and, and, and they actually they love it. They look forward to it, um, coming in and playing a game, get moving right away. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to start class. Definitely second that, guys. Uh, very similar to the way I run my classes. Um, so I won't really repeat anything, but... Uh, one tweak that I do, we have home base spots just like um, Adam Levo, and instead of doing the tape, we have uh, numbers and letters on the wall, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And so when I have like a double class coming into the gym, I'll have one side that has like three numbers, one through five on one wall, and then A through F on the other wall. The other side of the gym has orange numbers, one through five, A through F, and so then each kid will have a number like 3C and then they'll find their spots, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And uh, we did actually used to do the tape, but it just kept coming up all the time. It was super annoying. So we've done that now, and they've been up on the wall for like three years, and I haven't had to um, move them. And so uh, it works really well. We come in and do instant activity, and then kids go to home base, get warmed up. And that's a good time for me to check roll, make sure everybody's here, and take care of any issues that we have. All right, so... <laughs> I know we don't have our lower thirds on here, so the lower thirds aren't working too well. So, again, my name is Colin Brooks, uh, and I'm helping moderate this conversation. So if you're in the Tazel right now, yes, and if you look over to the far left, we, we see Mr. Adam P.E. Um, thank you. 
So, <laughs> so if you have any questions, uh, ask them, shoot them my way in our panel, and I'll try to get to them. So I just, we've talked a little bit about how we started our class now. Let's chat a little bit. Oh, the classroom management and procedures. Let's cut to it. Like, what is it? You know, we all know as physical educators, health teachers, that there's a huge difference between 15, 20 students and 50 to 60 students. And you know what? Some of those people, some of the people that are viewing this, even may have up to 100. So, what kind of suggestions do you have to um, our viewers out here as far as procedures and setting up really strong classroom management? Does one of you guys want to jump in? Yeah, go on, Ben. Go. Yeah, yeah, I can go ahead and get started. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, to be consistent with your starts and stops, with your verbiage, what, you know, whatever that may be, um, so that everyone knows what to expect each and every day. Um, so you know, right at the beginning of the year, it's it's so important to say, here's what this means, whatever you know, whatever your style is for teaching. Um, a couple years ago, we had a uh, two experts come in about executive functioning and our whole uh, faculty and staff was there and we discussed you know how you know executive functioning is, is so important and how to keep thoughts and you know things organized and one thing that they suggested is having a visible agenda for each class um, visible right there on if you have a whiteboard in your gym so that's one thing that um, I tried probably two three years ago and I've been doing it each day since. So it you know it takes me 30 seconds to write what we're going to do up on the whiteboard so that it's visible. And so it's you know whatever grade it is. So first first and second grade, we're doing you know a warm up, and then you put the number of minutes beside that. So if it's a five minute warm up, it's you know warm up five, and then you lay out what you're going to be doing for each break that you take. Uh, put that in a different color. So I usually have my activities in blue and then my breaks in orange so that the students know exactly how long this break is going to be so that they can budget their attention span. Um, it really it really helps them, especially with a large class, you don't know how long each kid is, is listening for. Um, but if they know that this break is only going to take two minutes, you know, they're, and as a teacher, you have to be aware of how long you're speaking and how long you're going. So, in addition to having the agenda up on the board about you know how long each section is going to take, uh, I have a giant digital clock on the wall that you can see from anywhere in the in the room. So, it's it's a nice way to focus on here's here's the time we have together, here's what we need to get done today, and here's how long each section is going to take. So every day. They come in. They don't need to ask what we're doing today. They can see up on the whiteboard uh, what we're doing and how long it's going to take. They get excited right away. Um, and you know, if if we are wasting time, I can you know just show them, hey, we have you know you know seven minutes left, and we still need to get through this and this. Um, so it really helps with the classroom management, uh, attention spans, and you know getting the maximum amount of learning in to each class. So that's just one. Uh, thing that I do for classroom management that uh, hopefully other teachers out there can use and see how it works with their students. Hey, Adam, just a quick follow-up question. Um, management strategies that kind of like help you with help you don't stay on task during like the warm-up, energizer, instant activity. Uh, it was just a question from the Tazel. So, do you see a lot of it? Do you see them pretty well engaged? Um, yeah, my students are pretty well engaged. Uh, one thing that I, I do use, uh, I sh wish I would have brought an example of it, but I'll, I'll throw one into the tassel uh, after this, but uh, it's something called an oops, uh, and I don't know where I got it from. I saw it at another uh, teacher's school, but it's just a paper, a half sheet of paper that they can go and fill out, and it has you know whatever off-task behavior that they were engaging in, um, and they basically just check or fill in the uh, the circle with whatever whatever they did wrong without me even telling them I just you know you know Johnny go fill out an oops or you know sometimes I have to tell two two students all right go fill out an oops they fill it out they put it in the Dropbox and they join right back in the activity so um, I don't have a ton of off-task behavior because you know we have 
the students are pretty well engaged, but on occasion, maybe you know, three, four, five times a week, I'll have a student go fill out an oops. And even for the older kids, it's a little embarrassing. You know, they they don't want to go over there and fill out an oops, but it's um, it's something they they realize. Hey, I was I was being off task, and it's it's a way for me to keep track of it quickly without stopping and punishing the entire class. And then they know what they did wrong, and they can improve that behavior. So that's one idea. I'll go jump in. Um, um, so for us, we have something similar to kind of like what he was saying with the oops. Um, we have some clipboards on the wall hanging on command strips that have a piece of paper on it. it has four different options. One is I was injured. One is I didn't wear the right shoes. One is um, I had to go to a refocus time, so kind of like going to timeout. And then another one is just a, and any other issues. They can just write it in. It's a blank. And so anytime kids come into the gym, instead of me having to deal with kids telling me why they're injured, why they can't participate, or why they don't have their shoes on, or what happened, um, they can immediately just go over, grab one of those clipboards off the wall, and fill it out. And then basically they'll just take that home. It has a parent signature line at the bottom, and they'll go get that signed. And so that gives me a chance when there's 50 kids coming in the door, instead of having to deal with five students while I'm trying to get the whole class started, those five students go over to the wall, they fill that sheet out, and then once the whole class is in the instant activity, then I'll go and find out what's going on. And then it's also just a good parent communication tool because if a kid comes in and tells me they're injured, I don't want to ask them to participate if they really are injured, but if they don't have a doctor's note, I need a parent signature. So they just fill it out, they take it home, and the parent signs it and brings it back. Um, so that's worked really well for us. Um, another thing that we do is a self-assessment at the end of every day. Um, we have a, um, on the wall, as they exit the gym, we have four different grades that they can get, and it's basically just a, a wow at the top, and that's kind of like an extra credit bonus opportunity that we give kids every day. So, for example, it relates to the, whatever growth outcome we're looking for. So, like last week, we were doing paddle skills, so the wow was if you could hit the ball consecutively three times off the wall. So I gave them three minutes to do that. If they could do that, then they could hit the wow on the way out. Um, and then the one below that is a good job, and so at the end of class, kids are lining up. They'll go out and they'll hit their grade. Good job is just doing your best and making sure that you follow all the gym rules. And then the one below that is keep on trying, and that would be if a student had to go to a refocus, they were talking during instruction, and then below that is um, a timeout form. So that's like if I had to send a note home to your parents, which honestly I almost never have to do that. Um, and I was really surprised when we started doing this how much of a difference it makes for kids to actually go out and either hit the wow or keep on trying on the way out. It really means a lot, even though in your mind you're like, it's just a piece of paper, what's the big deal? But um, kids are asking me every day, what's the wow challenge of the day? And then when kids leave, it's a way for you to make sure that you're communicating your expectations to your kids. Because if you had a kid that was uh, talking during instruction, on the way out, they have to own up to that. And so it's a way of making sure they're taking responsibility for themselves. So if I have a student that goes out, hits the good job, and I know that he was off task or talking when I was trying to teach the class, then I can pull him aside and talk to him about it and make sure he knows what my expectations are. So it's just like a really automated way to make sure that you're um, providing those uh, responsibility opportunities for your kids to take responsibility. Um, because if I didn't have that at the end of every day, I would just forget about all the little things that happened. And um, seeing students hit those grades kind of reminds me to talk to them about them, have those little mini conferences. So that's worked really well for us. Yeah, I've got to say, I've uh, I've used those posters, Ben, that you uh, created with the wow and the great stuff, etc. So they're on the side of my gym as the kids leave, and um, they definitely have that engagement of trying to obviously aim towards that wow at the end. But for me, like, I think it's so important that as physical educators, we make sure that we know that the learning objectives for our kids are actually there for our kids to be able to see. So it's not just saying we're going to do this, we're going to do that. The kids need to see what that success criteria looks like and what you're asking them to do. So putting them up on the board is something that I've always been used to because that's 
very much the British system. So making sure that learning's taking place by showing the kids what they need. I really like if you look at uh, Andy Vazali's mind maps and when he talks about the mind maps and that's something that I've started to try and work on when we're trying to look at what do we need to focus on or what do we already know about a subject. So a little tip for you that those that uh, um, use mind maps or anything on the learning objectives board, there's an app called Office Lens and it will take a picture of your a whiteboard and make it really clear so that you can then share that to either people that are away or you might want to revisit it at the end of a unit etc. So I use that to take pictures of the whiteboard so I can either share them and literally you can take it from any angle and it will square and rectangle it up and make it a lot clearer for you to read. So I really like that one. What was the name of that? Office Lens. It's a Microsoft app but it, um, obviously available on Apple. So, Adam, so it converts it to text, correct? Basically. It converts it. To, it converts it to a JPEG, but it's not just a photo. So it literally just takes the whiteboard and it actually makes the, the written work that's on your whiteboard a lot clearer to actually read. That's awesome. So it's it's helped me a lot this year, um, especially when wanting to share what I've done previously. Um, in terms of behavior management during the class. I saw something on Pinterest about two years ago and when I was working in China I'd always have Mr. Laval he's done this or Mr. Adam he's done this, Mr. Adam he's done this and I thought when I got into my new position that wasn't going to happen so we have something called a problem solving station and before the kids even come and speak to me and um, because obviously I can't deal with 55, 60 kids problems they go across to this station and I know a few other educators have put posters out there but what my posters have is like a picture as well as the writing so they have like the smiley face etc if they're happy or sad angry etc and that helps because a lot of my kids are EAL so it helps my kids to be able to distinguish what the emotion is that they're trying to say and then they explain and talk with their partner first then if they can't solve their problem that's when they come and speak to me and it's definitely cut down on the amount of students that come to me to say I have a problem with X, Y or Z. So it's like Ben just said, it's about giving them the responsibility to be able to problem solve together because that's obviously a key skill that they're going to need for the rest of their lives. Also through the middle school, high school we use solo taxonomy and with our bigger classes that definitely helped to see where students were at the start of the lesson and where they were going to towards the end of the lesson. And for those that don't know about that, I think it's something that you should maybe look into because it could be something that really helps your practice. It's just a different type of pedagogy, but for PE, it really shows growth throughout a lesson. And then last one I've got is, I've just been making notes as you lot have been talking so I don't forget anything, um, is use technology. I replicate myself a hundred times just by using technology because like we can't get her physically around everywhere but by using the technology we can try and work with smaller groups etc so oh and one more before I pass you off to the next question Colin Mike Graham posted something and I'm gonna post it on the tozzle now and it was about stickable whiteboards so what we do now is we stick smaller whiteboards around the gym and that helps us to split our groups up when they're collaborating when they want to work together in small groups and they can then obviously use those smaller whiteboards that are literally mag uh, static across the wall and it helps them to obviously put their ideas across and I'll post that link in the tozzle now. So just a quick follow-up question because I think a lot of the viewers are going to want to know so how do you duplicate yourselves? What applications are you using to video yourself or just can you tell us a little bit more about that real quick Adam? Um, I've been experimenting with GIFs this year, so for those, not the smiley cat or something that keeps coming up and down on your, your screen, um, more of uh, actually me doing the actions and then putting it up on a TV or a projector so that I can then go and work myself around. I'm not having to keep demonstrating what I'm asking the students to look for. Um, also, BAM video delay, allowing the kids to actually see themselves and by putting it at a four screens you'll be able to then set the timer so the kids can see themselves four times rather than just the once 
So you could set it up at 10 set. They do the action. So, for example, we're on basketball for our middle school at the moment. They'll take the free throw. They'll then go around, and there'll be a one screen on 10 seconds, 15, 18, 20, or whatever. So they can see themselves four times, and they can start to pick out their uh, things they're doing wrong and the things they're doing right as well. Two stars and a wish, I call it. Awesome. You know, there's so many different websites or programs that you can make um, animated GIFs, uh, just depending on how complex you you know you desire them to be. Um, and I'm sure we can post some of those links within the Tozzle here too. So moving on, um, something that I, I constantly think about when I'm teaching. You know, and th these are all good things that, that work with not only large class sizes that we're discussing, but obviously. Uh, any class size, so this is really good information. So, talk about transitions. So, when students do, you know, essentially know what we're going to say and know what to do quickly, because we all know we have limited time. We all want to use every single second we have. So, can you discuss how um, transitions work within your class? Yeah, I can. I'll jump in. Um, quickly. But yeah, transitions are, are so huge, especially with large class sizes. Um, one thing I just started doing about a month or two ago is, you know, giving giving step-by-step -step inst instructions. So limit it to maybe <laughs> one to three at the most things that you are going to require those kids to do in a, in a transition. So if they're you know, obviously, if they're going to get a ball, get a partner, go to an area, like, that seems so simple as a teacher, uh, but, man, does it take a while for large class sizes to do that um, from time to time. So one thing I started to do lately is uh, breaking down my instructions, uh, you know, saying one thing and then say, can you repeat that to a neighbor? And so they just turn to somebody next to them. They repeat what I just said. Um, so if they missed it, they just at least got it again there, um, which takes you know two seconds to do. Um, and then I'll introduce the next thing. Can you repeat that to a neighbor? Boom, they, they do it again. All right, we're going to transition now. You have so many seconds to do that. So give them you know, 5, 10 seconds or whatever it is. Um, and then I usually will start to count down verbally from five, um, in a nice slow, like five, four, three, you know, everyone's scrambling to get to their spot, one. And then we're usually, hopefully, most people are, are where they're supposed to be at that point. Um, and if not, then I'll usually put, I'll usually put the blame on myself um, and say, Maybe I wasn't a very good teacher right there. Uh, maybe I wasn't clear with my instructions. I apologize. Um, and then the kids are kind of like, "No, yeah, you you were, you you said it right. You were a good teacher, that sort of thing." So I usually will just throw that out there just to kind of get them back on my side, um, you know, and, and just kind of question my ability a little bit. And it usually works, you know, for the next time. Okay, here's here's what we're doing. Transition to the next thing. So. Um, it's really important to have whatever procedure you have in place to, to transition that it's the same each time. They know what to expect. Um, and then in a little bit, I want to show a couple things about uh, some, some partnering, and partnering and then transitioning from partners because I think it's so important for um, students to be able to work in partners in small groups and to work with lots of different people and to do it quickly, which is a challenge with large class sizes. But anybody else have other ideas about transitions? Well, you can sort of, like for me, you can, when you're doing your transitions, you can basically see if kids are off, top, off task or off topic. And sometimes it's just about questioning to see maybe what they understand. So like for me, like I said, a lot of my students are EAL. So it could have been that they might need some extra uh, either speaking to or they might need uh, some uh, pictures they might need some other sort of way of me putting the information across so yeah like you said Adam sometimes it can be um, you reflect and think well maybe I didn't explain that correctly and it's just about reinforcing what you've already said yeah I agree with that um, I definitely think we gotta make sure that we are uh, checking for understanding and you can do that 
So when you give the directions, like Adam said, keep it to one to three for sure and have the kids repeat back to you. So if we're cleaning up after a game, I say jersey in the basket, ball in the bucket, high five a partner and line up. And then thumbs up if you understand. And then look around and if you see two kids that aren't giving you a thumbs up because they're off in la-la land looking at the ceiling, then you need to repeat the directions until everybody gives you that thumbs up. Um, another thing you can do is, especially with kindergarten and first grade, they're so visual that if you give even two directions, they're, they can't process that in their head with audio, so at least all the students won't be able to. So what you can do is say, can anybody show me what to do? So when you explain the game, if they're getting a jersey, getting a ball, and finding some open space, um, and if you just say go, you're going to have kids dribbling the ball, shooting the ball, but if you said, can anybody show me what to do, and then you have one student, go get the jersey, go get a ball, put it on the ground between their feet, then kids seeing that, they're going to be able to remember it a lot more than if you just had them repeat it or if you just repeated it twice to them. Um, especially with those younger students, that little student demo is pretty huge. Um, one other thing that I found is really important is making sure that if at all possible, there's always different scenarios, but if at all possible, you separate your instruction from your organization because if you if you explain a game and then you have to split kids up and get them in certain places around the gym, they're not going to remember the rules to the game. So if it's possible, go ahead and organize everything how you want it for the game to start and then explain the game to the kids so they can visualize where they are on the field or where they are on the court, who's on the other team, what baskets or what goals they're trying to shoot at, where the boundary lines are. Because if they're all in one area and you're drawing a diagram on the board, it's a lot harder to understand than when they're actually sitting in their spots where they're actually going to be when the game starts. And then when you actually get done explaining the game, all you have to do is say, everybody stand up, and then play the game. Whereas if you explain it and then you have to get everybody situated, I found that kids just totally forget all the rules of the game. So that's one big thing I always try to do is separate that or the organization from the instruction. I agree, and like, even if you can try and scaffold the information, so you start off at one level and then slowly build it up, you're more likely to get a better understanding from the students as well. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's great comments, and feel free to jump in again. So I just, I'm just listening to this and thinking about how, how I deal with some things, and I guess the first thing in the morning is, you know, when I'm about to teach is I think about what size is each class, what students are within each class, how should I respond to each student within that class. So, you know, one class might be 20, and the next class that rolls in might be 50. So uh, thinking about how I set up equipment, equipment distribution within the gym will directly impact, you know, the success uh, of the students that, ha that they have within the class. So, um, you know, and I really like the fact that a lot of us are saying, putting it on ourselves, what did I do wrong? How can I change my teaching? Um, looking at ourselves internal and reflecting kind of on the spot and letting students know. I mean, having that little piece of honesty or vulnerability like, hey, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm just here to uh, be your teacher and I care about you. You know, those types of things go a long way. So that's awesome. I also um, think like if, if we start to think about how we've got a plan and it's like making sure that all the little things are planned. So all... Andy Zali talks about sweating the small stuff because he's when he talking about the astronaut's guide to Earth. And it's so true that you've got to make sure that every little bit's planned. Just like Ben was saying, he's thinking about what his organization was, how it's going to be, and what you said, Colin, how are you going to go from A, B, C? So we've really got to make sure that you're well planned and then you'll be able to, your lesson, if it goes Pete Tong, we would say in England, that happens. But... We've also got to think of those external factors that we can't, we've got no control of, but if we sort of cover all the bases, then you're well planned, then we can take student learning to that next level. Exactly. Uh, so, great comments. Um, this, we're having, and just feel free again in the tozzle, keep bringing those questions to us. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about partnering now. And when you get, how do you group your students? How do you partner your students? How do you make sure that those groups are, ha, have, uh, you know, are equitable for all students, and that students, you know, I guess are, are on tasks within those groups? 
Well, I just put a, I just put a, something in the Tosla and called jigsaw learning or cooperative learning, and giving students that individual responsibility. And last in the summer when I met obviously a few of you at the National P Institute, um, Dr. Ash Casey was doing something on jigsaw learning, cooperative learning. Now I'd never heard it called that, but I'd done something similar in my lessons before. And then recently I've been chatting with Ash about a number of things and. He was telling me more about jigsaw learning. We've been actually trying to implement that at our sort of upper elementary and middle school and high school, and giving the kids the responsibility to feed that information back, so they then can. We we all know that they've got an understanding of what they need to do because they feel that they've got a responsibility of feeding that information back to their original group. Yeah, a couple of things that I do for partnering. Um, one of them is I use an app called uh, TeamShake, and I either use it on my iPad or my iPhone. I have all the students in there. Um, if it's partnering, you know, I just kind of call it out. I sometimes I have a TV. I have a TV in a, on a cart in my gym. Sometimes it's set up. Sometimes it's not worth it to set up. Um, so sometimes I'll just project it onto the TV screen, find your partner, go there, which is, um, if you're not using TeamShake out there um, and you're a PE teacher, use it. It'll change your life. Um, another one that, that I've done before, I think it's from Spark Curriculum, is kind of the mingle, mingle, walk around, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe with a group of two or a group of three, four, or whatever it is. Um, the kids get that pretty quickly. They kind of walk or mingle or jog close to their buddies and um, in order to mix it up I, I usually use Team Shake. Um, but uh, there's one thing that I, I do as far as skill practice called partner positions which I made up. If, if I can jump on and do a screen share Colin I would uh, I can show that right now if that's alright. Yeah go for it buddy. Okay let me just show you this. All right, are you guys seeing that? Yeah, man. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to channel my inner Joey Fife with I, I did some animations here, so hopefully it works. So this is basically my gym court lines and when I do have the kids in partner uh, in partnerships, then I have them go to partner position 1, it's called, uh, which is a short distance away. So I have can you guys see the partners on the blue line and then one across from them on the orange line? For me, no. No. What about no, you guys? You guys see it? No, we get screens blank. Sorry, buddy. Okay. It's not working here. Um, bummer. Okay. Um, Sorry, man. That's all right. So are you still seeing a blank? Or? Uh, no, I mean, we can see it as long as you don't go to uh, the oh, presentation. Ah, cool. uh, I got gotcha. you, okay. So we can see your slides. Okay, so you you can see it now with the partners across from each uh, other? We see you now, but you can put it back to screen share, uh, and then okay. we'll be good to go. All right. Yeah, it's all good. guess you need a whiteboard behind you. You can have uh, Adam level draw for you. I know, <laughs> I, need, I need some animated GIFs. <laughs> all right. Can you see that now? <laughs> yes, we're good to go. Yeah, buddy. We see it. All, right. All right, so partner position one. This is a short distance uh, away from one another. And in this, you know, in these positions, it's nice to do skill practice. So if they're tossing a ball to one another, um, they can practice with one partner. Uh, I always have the inside partner rotate. So the inside partner is the partner closest to the inside part of the gym. Um, and then they'll rotate, you know, one spot counterclockwise. Uh, and we always rotate the same direction counterclockwise. So uh, if we're doing something, a skill practice where they're doing something from a short distance, tossing and catching, it's nice and, and simple. Uh, and then when you rotate one partner over counterclockwise, you get to work with somebody new. Uh, partner position two is a medium distance, so they move back and everyone has different lines set up in their gym. Um, so if you have some sort of landmarks, uh, that have a short medium distance, this works pretty well. And again, when you rotate, 
the ball or whatever implement you're using is going to go to the partner on the blue line or the outside of the gym. Uh, that's the way we do it so that the inside partner can rotate and then they're ready to go with the next skill practice. Um, I did put some really pretty animations in here, but um, if it's not working, it's not working. The third position is a long distance, so I have them go on the east and west sides of the gym, and then their partner is across from them towards the inside um, of, of the gym. So uh, I teach the kids partner position one, two, and three at the beginning of the year, um, and it works extremely well for all age levels with doing anything where you're working on skills with a partner and it allows them to work with many different people and transition very very quickly so even with my kindergartners I use partner positions they know the term they know how to rotate it uh, it saves us a ton of time throughout the entire school year when we're working um, on any different skill or in certain games we use the partner positions as well so um, back to anybody else uh, I just have one quick comment about the partner stuff if you uh, if you're partnering people up and I'm, I'm sure every PE teacher has had that problem where kids are switching they get a partner and then they find somebody else and they leave that person hanging or they're just taking forever to get a partner I think that um, sometimes as teachers we can kind of let some of that management stuff slide because we're so focused on getting the lesson done but I think it's really important to to put that management and especially the affective stuff first especially when you have kids that are not treating their classmates correctly so if that ever happens I always try to stop the entire class bring everybody back together and use that as a teachable moment to talk about hey why how would it make you feel if you partnered up with somebody and then they just left you hanging and went in with somebody else. And then we talk about it. And then we also talk about why it's so important for us to just be able to get with somebody really quick because we don't want to waste all of our time practicing skills because that's going to be hurting ourselves. We're not going to be getting better at whatever the focus was for that day. Um, so just taking a few seconds to breathe when you're frustrated and then bringing your class in and really talking about the why behind um, the importance of being able to partner up quickly is really important. I think all the, the strategies are great, but when stuff goes bad, I don't think we should just keep keep moving with the lesson. We need to, to stop the class and talk about it with the kids because the more we teach it to them, I mean, it's a skill just like anything else. The more you teach it to them, the better they're going to get at it. But if you never take time to refine it, then they're just always going to keep doing the same thing. All right, just yeah. thinking about transitions and stuff, a real quick thing or a hack you could call it that I do to make sure that students are on task, especially specifically in big groups or when they get with partners, um, is to do some kind of physical activity when they get with their partner. So, for instance, when I say go, point to the person who's closest to you, stand back to back and do jumping jacks or stand back to back and do an exercise. That way, you know, when we're talking about that 10 to 15 to 20 second window, that transitional period that can cause some students to become off task, especially, you know, within a huge classroom uh, with a lot of students, um, that can help kind of eliminate that and give them a task to do during that time. So does anyone else have any, like, little transition hacks like that, or we can definitely move on to uh, an, another part of the conversation as well. All right, we'll move on. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so, um, we have, you know, we've got about, about five or six minutes. Um, just tell us a little bit, any you know, parting thoughts about any advice that you have for, you know, a couple different people, those veteran teachers that have been teaching large class sizes for a long time that need, you know, that that's rough, you know, that can that can wear on you. Um, any suggestions for them? And also those brand new teachers that are going in to have their first job, you know, what, what suggestions do you have for them um, to help them within those situations as well? 
I think for all teachers, we, we, we put an expectation on our students to be constantly learning and I honestly think that all teachers need to be constantly learning as well. So I think if you stop learning then you're giving an injustice to your students. So by first of all getting on Twitter and connecting with people and finding out what other people are doing in their classrooms, it definitely helps to push me that little bit further and make me a, a stronger teacher and just to see what's going on in people's classrooms to think, whoa, that's really good. I need to try and take that to a new level in my classes because we're not doing that at the moment. Some of the things we're talking about today, I'm like, I like that and I'm making notes here now and thinking, yeah, we could we could start to look at a few of those things. So I think if we're all constantly learning and pushing the profession forward, then those teachers will obviously or hopefully get on board. And for the new teachers, don't try to do too much maybe ask questions, learn from the more experienced teachers, but also look for what new ideas are out there and how they can implement those into their own practice from not just PE teachers but from any other subject teachers to try and think, okay, I like just seeing what I've just seen in a history lesson, but now how can I replicate that in my own uh, PE lessons? Yeah, absolutely. And what I was going to, I would like to add on to what um, Adam Levo said, um, is in addition to being prepared and being, you know, well informed and reflective about your own, you know, teaching practices. Um, I think it's really important to be, obviously, prepared for each lesson and then consistent with your demeanor, consistent with your uh, language. Um, and I, it's it's funny because I've met all of the. Everyone here in this Google Hangout, I met you guys last year at the National PE Institute, and we're all like pretty calm, very patient people, um, but we're really, really reflective. And I think it's really important to to let your, however that is, is let your patience, you know, refill in some way. So like if you, you know, meditate or whatever it is, but you have to like be able to, after one class, you can't carry it over to the next one. Um, you have to find a way to be consistent, uh, whatever, deep breathing exercises, just being able to, to start each class with, you know, a new level of patience because, man, in this profession especially, if you start to show that you're a little bit out of control, it's just, it's gonna, you know, it's just gonna carry over and your your lessons aren't going to be you know as as good as they otherwise could. So uh, being consistent, you know, letting things go and, and remaining patient, uh, I think, are huge. Uh, no matter what your classroom management is, you know, or your philosophy, if you can if you can handle those two things, uh, I think you'll have some success with with large class sizes. Hey, real quick, we've got about, sorry guys, about two minutes, and I think we're going to go off air, And um, but Ben, I definitely want to give you some time to reflect and give some advice as well. Cool, yeah, um, I was just going to say, you got to be careful about comparing yourself to others. Um, with, social, social, with social media, we have this view in everybody's classroom, and if you have 95 kids, you try to compare yourself to somebody who has 20 kids you're going to feel really bad about the way you teach. And you can't do that because it's two totally different situations. Um, you have to look at your specific situation and try to find ways um, to make it the best that you can for your kids. Um, and then just practically, I think um, the best large group game resource that I've ever found is all the books by J.D. Hughes. He, he teaches in Georgia, and he has... Double classes coming in. He's the only teacher. He has anywhere from 50 to 70 kids at a time. And so all of his books are kind of designed in that way. So if you're in that same situation, I would highly recommend checking those books out. They're all really, really great resources for phys ed. Great. Hey, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to our awesome panel here. Uh, so I would, I would encourage everyone, if you're on the, the large class hacks, Tozzle, back channel, to continue your conversation and definitely give these guys um, some more questions because I'm sure they'll be there and they'll be there to answer it. So thanks, panel, so much for joining us. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. All right, everyone. Stay tuned for the next session coming up here. <laughs> See you later.